Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this World Council of Credit Unions Challenge 2025 webinar, Credit Union Cybersecurity Challenges and Best Practices. My name is Greg Newman. I am the Director of Communications for World Council of Credit Unions. Today, we'll see presentations from credit union IT professionals who will provide us some very different perspectives on this topic. Jonathan Silly is the Vice President of Information Technology at Hudson Valley Credit Union here in the United States. He will give us the large credit union perspective on this issue, while Paul Treese, Volunteer IT Director at Lewisham Plus Credit Union Limited in London will provide a point of view from a much smaller credit union. And at the conclusion of their presentations, we'll have a Q&A session with both Jonathan and Paul. I wanna mention right at the top here that if you have any questions for them, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you bring your cursor down there, you should see that. You can type your questions in there. Also, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available later today on the World Council YouTube cha uh, channel. That's at youtube.com slash I want to give you a little bit of background on our presenters today now who are going to do a joint presentation actually for us today. Uh, Jonathan Silly is the Vice President of Information Technology at Hudson Valley Credit Union. Located in the state of New York, Hudson Valley is one of the 40 largest credit unions in the United States with more than $5 billion in assets. Jonathan has been with Hudson Valley for more than nine years, first as their Director of Information Technology before being promoted to Vice President of IT where he leads a team of more than 30 IT professionals. Paul Treese is the Volunteer Treasurer and Volunteer IT Director for Lewis and Plus Credit Union, which he was a founding member of way back in 1992 before they even had to worry about IT. Lewisham is significantly smaller than Hudson Valley Credit Union with just 10 million British pounds or about 14 million US dollars in assets and a staff of just 20 people total with no full-time IT professionals. Paul does IT for Lewisham on top, on top of his day job. And we should note Paul is also the secretary for the London and Southeast Forum for the Association of uh, British Credit Unions. So we thank them both for being here today um, and I'll turn it over to you guys. Just took a moment to get the unmute there. Um, so, uh, hello, um, those who've come through. Uh, I'm Paul Treese. Uh, it's a real privilege to be able to share this session today and to give you our perspective. Um, what um, Greg didn't say in my background, I work in IT professionally, have about 30 years experience in the business. Um, so that's, uh, that's one side of my life. The credit union, I guess, is my second job, but the one that doesn't pay the bills. Uh, but uh, it does take a lot of time. I'm very grateful to share that with, uh, with you today. Jonathan, did you want to say anything else or should I, should I go into the screen share? Sure, just real quick, um, a little about my, uh, my professional experience beyond Hudson Valley. I've worked in credit unions for about the past 15 years uh, professionally in various capacities of IT management and information security management. Uh, and through credit unions of varying sizes from uh, under uh, $300 million up to uh, Hudson Valley where we've actually surpassed $6 billion in assets today. So uh, very different experiences and I look forward to speaking with all of you today. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Paul. Sure. And just, just by comparison, the UK credit union movement as a whole, uh, we're currently looking at uh, just over two and a half billion dollars of assets across the entire country. So we're, we're smaller than you are. Let's see if I can get the screen share going. OK, have we got the screen as we need it? That can up okay? Hopefully. Yep, we can see it. Okay. That's Looks good, Paul. Looks good. Thanks very much. So yes, yeah, so we've done the intro. So really the, the agenda for the session, uh, we're gonna actually start with the small credit union perspective and uh, I'll provide some input to that um, from uh, organizations, which I hope will, will connect with uh, some of the, uh, the delegates attending today. I did run an, an International Credit Union Day event um, in October 
where I was privileged to uh, to do a round the world trip. We heard from delegates um, who talked to us about the credit union experience in the Philippines, uh, in uh, Kenya and Africa, in uh, Brazil, in Cicredi, uh, in the US and uh, also in the Caribbean. So uh, I do have some experience of the international movement, but I do appreciate that it's very different in different countries. And uh, for those of you noticing the difference, uh, the picture was from a holiday. Uh, I've had my, my post COVID lockdown haircut last week, so it's a little bit shorter. Um, we're just coming out of lockdown in the UK and uh, my, my regards and uh, concerns for everybody who's, who's facing COVID issues in your own countries. So um, let me uh, let me get on with the uh, presentation for you. Um, I, I guess from a small credit union perspective, my observations in the UK, um, with my own board and certainly with other other credit unions I work with through the Association of British Credit Unions Limited, uh, a lot of boards uh, have have quite a lot of worries in this area, but not not necessarily much skill or experience. That's gradually changing uh, as people come in and the uh, the movement moves on. Uh, but certainly, um, on the whole, uh, our boards in the UK uh, lack experience in IT, and many of them don't have um, any professional IT support in those areas. That's driven by small budgets, um, probably very low expenditure on IT typically, uh, and pretty low operational margins. Um, certainly, the observation around the UK, if we make a 1% return on assets, that's pretty good. A lot of credit unions don't make that. Um, some of them are negative. Um, so um, the small credit union capacity and capability really is about um, managing within limited means and doing the best that we can uh, with few or no professional resources uh, and drawing on volunteers and others and, and of course also buying services where you haven't got the resource yourself, you can buy services from others. Um, but again, the experience is uh, many IT systems can be old, not necessarily well maintained and that, that creates some issues. And it particularly creates issues because the member demand is still there. Whether you're small or large, uh, your members are going to be demanding um, services from you which are effective, which have a digital reach, uh, and which uh, they want to consume probably in a digital way uh, in 2021, in addition to what they want to do in person-to-person -person work. Uh, you're going to be needing to use uh, all sorts of different aspects of IT in your delivery to survive and to grow and to compete. And in terms of uh, your risk registers, um, you should be considering that the risk of a data breach is at or near the top of your risk register. And the reason for that, pretty serious, can be very serious consequences, both the credit union, but also for your members in terms of their data, uh, which could be taken or impacted. Um, and the probability is extraordinarily high. Uh, in the UK, uh, our government tells us that 81% of large organizations have reported data breaches. Um, my guess is that it's, uh, it's probably uh, somewhat similar around small organizations. And I think, I think the statistic I heard a few weeks ago was that 46% of organizations around the UK had some kind of IT data breach last year. So plus getting towards 50%. So a very serious consequence and uh, coming to a seminar like this, of course, is to help address that. So I'm gonna give you a couple of case examples just, just to pick out the things that can happen. So the first one, uh, small credit union, all credit unions in the UK are small by global standards. Uh, remote access had to be enabled for home working for COVID. Many people around the world may recognize that. We, we had lockdowns in the UK last year and sent everyone home and credit unions had to respond by um, adding home working capabilities. Firewalls um, were in good shape, but there was an unpatched vulnerability unknown to the credit union. And uh, around the world, there were around 50,000 uh, equivalent firewalls that had the same challenge, apparently, because somebody took the trouble to scan the whole network, the whole of the internet, pretty much, and to publish the list of 50,000 firewalls complete with any access passwords and IDs they could find through this unpatched vulnerability. Um, so that potentially meant that the data was on the dark web and the data breach could have happened in a few minutes had anyone bothered to use that data. 
Uh, the only mitigation was that there were 50,000 others, um, so it was uh, it was only one amongst many. It was noticed by a service provider. Firewalls were patched, passwords were changed. Uh, Multi-factor sort of second factor authentication was added for remote access, so that a password and something else was required. And then a detailed log analysis was performed, which which very uh, fortunately confirmed that no data had been accessed, none of those none of those breached IDs had been exploited. So a couple of lessons uh, for this. First one, it's rather a scary one, but basically if you are on the internet, you will be attacked. And if you're um, looking for passwords, your strong passwords may not be enough because in this example, the passwords were strong, but they were stolen anyway. And a stolen strong password is still a stolen password. It's not enough. And that's particularly true, I guess, for here for remote access. So a lesson there, uh, whatever else you're doing today, if you didn't know when your files were last patched, write that down as something to check with your service provider or your IT staff uh, or your volunteers, if you're running with volunteers like we are. Um, there is a recommendation for this area that you need professional support because the uh, boundary services are a critical part of the security, it's not enough. But if you don't have the support to have logging in place, uh, you'll be blind to anything that happens. So a second recommendation here is uh, to make sure that you have logging activity in place so that if you do have a breach, you have a decent chance of finding what it's found, whether it was exploited and what might have been accessed. Second example, a uh, very common use case, unfortunately, a uh, credit union infected by um, a locking piece of software. A uh, member of staff clicked on an email, downloaded uh, in unintentionally um, uh, a piece of malware, and it started to uh, lock the screen and give uh, messages uh, that uh, data would need to be ransomed. Uh, fortunately, the member of staff was aware of what had happened, realized within a few seconds of what uh, I think it was a she had done, and uh, the IT was closed down very quickly. Uh, that meant that the incident was intercepted, uh, the data that was impacted was limited and was restored, and there was a full recovery. So again, a very fortunate escape. However, uh, two months later, uh, they discovered that uh, there was uh, a bit more to this, and maybe there'd been a bit longer between the uh, breach and the crypto incident because they got a demand for a ransom in Bitcoin, uh, which confirmed there had been a genuine breach and the data was um, potentially uh, available. The ransom wasn't paid. The credit union instead did some really clear and transparent communication with its members to let them know what had happened, to advise them to be safe, and communicated effectively to manage the damage to their reputation. They changed all passwords, they put additional checks in, um, and the investigation actually eventually traced that, that this was coming, this probably came from a brute force attack where someone had um, bombarded a login with um, passwords uh, from a, a list of potentially commonly used passwords until they'd found one that worked and had got into the systems. So again, a couple of examples, lessons from that. Um, in this case, uh, the communications um, that they were did quickly, they did really well, were absolutely critical in limiting damage. And they maintained member support, they didn't have a great loss to their business, um, and the damage was limited by that, that really strong communication that they had and put in place. Second lesson, um, if you've got passwords accessible, make sure you've got controls on password attempts uh, so that they can't be repeatedly attempted until someone eventually finds one that matches because it doesn't take long if you run a system against that. And another lesson around improving patching, stronger firewalls and logging because this credit union didn't have all that in place and needed it. So that's a couple of examples. And then just sort of coming upwards from there from uh, so some general ones. Um, I think it's true across the industry at the moment that the, uh, the biggest risk we all face is our own actions and our own users' actions. It is so easy to click on an email that you didn't intend to. Uh, I was offered one a couple of months ago that said, um, here's your invitation for a COVID vaccination, click here. 
I thought about it for a while because I was quite tempted to book a COVID vaccination, um, but actually it was a scam and I didn't click on it, but I easily could have done. And in those circumstances, it's only really the training and the practice and the message to be really careful that stops people falling into, uh, into, uh, into fault. So training users is important, multi-factor authentication, really important. And, and actually underlying that, um, because people are people, uh, certainly for my own credit union, we, uh, we run an annual program now and we confirm with every member of staff that they've done that, we log the fact that they've, they've taken the training we asked them to do, and we make sure that, uh, that nobody is missed. Really important message. So again, something simple, but can be applied. And then there's the getting the basics right. If you're a small credit union, uh, you're probably struggling to do the basics. So this is the place to start. Make sure you've got a modern operating system on your desktops, that you're not still using Windows XP, um, and that you've patched and updated, and you do patch and update regularly. That's really just basic basics. Um, secondary, uh, another use case, common is loss of, loss of devices. Not a hacking instant here, but someone leaving them on a train, um, falling out of a pocket, you never, you never know. Could be stolen. And cars, car, theft of laptops from cars is very common in the UK as well. So again, make sure your data is encrypted on those devices. Uh, already mentioned the boundary defenses, clearly the antivirus is also important. And it's important that you check it's up to date. It's quite easy for a particular desktop or PC um, to stop updating antivirus because some, some problem occurred and it didn't update, or maybe a user canceled something if they're allowed to do that. So make sure you check that you are up to date, that your defenses are intact. Um, and make sure you have backups, multiple layers of backups, because um, if you're breached, you're going to need them to recover, um, including something off network and make sure those are good and test them. And then really the headline message, the secondary headline, you need a recovery plan. It is highly likely that you will be breached at some point in the next year, um, maybe in the next two years. If you're fortunate, you may not be. And if your defenses are good, you reduce the probability, but you need the recovery plan. You need to know how you're gonna react if that happens and when it happens. And as I already mentioned, the comms, both with regulators and with members, uh, as well as with staff and board members is a critical part of that. So how do you get help? Well, I'm guessing that each country around the globe probably has its own equivalent of this. But in the UK, we have um, a national cyber security center who are concerned to encourage businesses, large and small, to take um, common sense steps to protect themselves and to uh, reduce the risk of being uh, breached and to reduce the impact if they are. So they have a 10 step program. We've touched on a number of these areas already. I won't go through them all, but those are things that uh, are advised to help organizations, large and small, reduce the risk of incident. And uh, the guidance really is um, use it. If you haven't got all these in place, and certainly many credit unions in the UK don't have all these in place, um, work through them, pick them out, work on them, look at the risks, and put a program in place for your credit union um, to work to continuously improve until you're at a stage where you've got these um, and potentially some others as well in a stage where, where you're well protected. So I'm gonna just, just bring this back um, to conclude my section um, with a letter which was sent out to all uh, credit unions uh, by the Bank of England, the Prudential Regulation Authority. They send an annual assessment to the sector once a year and this is an extract from their letter in September 2020, so last year's letter. Um, they have a topic around operational resilience that they um, have been promoting as an area for credit union concern and action, because they expect us to take notice of their letters. And you'll see that they expect us to assume that an incident will happen and to have the policies and the procedures in place to protect our business and our members. And that again is a message to push around the globe for those who are listening today, um, that you should expect this. Your regulator may be writing to you about it as they are in the UK for us, uh, but if they're not today, they probably will be tomorrow. With that, if it's okay, I'm gonna hand over to uh, Jonathan for uh, his perspective from Hudson Valley. Great, thank you, Paul. 
Um, I appreciate the introduction. And uh, much like Paul uh, in the UK, we're, we're focused on many of the same things uh, at Hudson Valley. And um, whether large or small, we face a significant number of the same challenges uh, both today and in the future, um, just at different scales. And so my goal today is to give you some perspective on uh, what at the larger end of the credit union industry in the US and around the globe we're looking at uh, in regards to best practices in information security, uh, as well as what our regulators are looking at um, and, and Hudson Valley has a bit of a unique perspective. Uh, we are a, what, what is considered called a state chartered credit union in the United States. So uh, we, are, we fall under the supervision of the Department of Financial Services in New York, uh, the state of New York in the US. Uh, and also we fall under the supervision of uh, the National Credit Union Administration in the U.S. So we kind of have two different regulators that we're responsible to, uh, and the state of New York has what I would consider to be a more stringent set of requirements than even the federal government. Uh, so with that, we will go into the regulatory environment in the U.S. that Hudson Valley looks at today. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. So in terms of the regulatory, regulatory highlights uh, in the US as we see them right now, uh, today regulators are really focused on solid governance models more so than ever. Uh, it's not just the technical aspects of your information security or IT programs uh, in your organization. They want to know that from the board of directors on down uh, that everybody is aware of the risks presented from the outside world to the credit union, and also that they are taken seriously and addressed proactively and quickly. Uh, so that is a, a key point of all of our regulatory exams today. Uh, and as I mentioned, governance is weighted just as heavily as having the right technology and tools, especially at a credit union of Hudson Valley size. Uh, the significant coverage of recent information security events really has regulators on edge in the US. And they are, in, in my view, um, starting to try and make up some lost ground in regards to uh, really getting their hands around what these types of higher tech, more advanced delivery systems in terms of software delivery and service delivery mean to the organization, uh, specific examples of those, and, and I'm sure that, that most of you are all aware of at this point, um, the SolarWinds supply chain attacks uh, were a significant wake-up call to the industry in the U.S. Uh, the recent spate of Microsoft Exchange vulnerabilities uh, have been another uh, major wake-up call to both state and federal regulators. Uh, and then just the ongoing sort of drama with Facebook and their decisions or, or lack of decision to um, really address some of the data disclosures and the, 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 the sort of frequency at which this is happening, um, not just with Facebook, but with the many, many of these very large um, social media driven organizations where it seems as though data doesn't take as much of degree of importance as maybe it should be and as maybe as consumers or your members deserve it to be. Um, and from these, these incidents or these events, we've found that regulators, regulators are increasingly likely to request information outside of annual audits. Uh, for example, the state of New York in both the solar wind supply chain attacks and the Microsoft Exchange vulnerabilities that were recently disclosed have made a point of going to all of their credit unions that they supervise and seeking specific uh, information about remediation activities that those organizations have taken to address these individual and, and specific vulnerabilities. So this is much more targeted and much more specific than we have ever seen before in regards to individual 
vulnerabilities that have been found in specific software packages. So that's a, that's a real change uh, for us. It, it's never been that targeted of regulatory enforcement before, but we're seeing that happen more and more. And to the point where we've started to become um, just to expect that anytime there's a significant vulnerability found in a software package, uh, that our regulators are going to reach out within a matter of days and ask us, one, do we have the software? Uh, two, how are we using it? And what information is contained in it? And three, um, how quickly are you going to patch it? And if you're not going to patch it, when are you taking it off your network? Because we don't want it there anymore. Um, so it's, it's a very, very targeted approach. Um, and I think it's also worth while mentioning that in the US uh, for a state chartered credit union like Hudson Valley Credit Union, those, you know, the, the 50 different states can take a vastly and widely different approach to governing and regulating the financial institutions that are under their supervision. So while New York state may be taking the approach that Hudson Valley is saying or seeing, um, you know, a state like Colorado or Texas might be taking a widely different approach or not as stringent of approach. So it really does vary greatly based on geography. Um, and so that is a difference between being a nationally chartered credit union in the US and a state chartered credit union uh, in the US. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. So in terms of what we have observed specifically from regulatory priorities, uh, based on what we've been asked and what we know our peers have been asked. Um, in, in large part, we're seeing a very high degree of significance uh, in third party and fourth party due diligence work across the credit union. And when I say that, it's, it's no longer good enough just to know what your partners, your vendor partners are doing. You need to know what their vendor partners are doing and what their security footprint looks like. Um, because our regulators are, are increasingly focused because of things like solar winds on supply chain attacks. Uh, and that means it's not just your vendor, it's their vendors now that can impact the credit union's operations. Um, secondly, risk assessments for all internal and external platforms uh, are considered to be a must with risk mitigation plans in for each. Uh, a specific uh, sort of very useful piece of governance when it comes to this is making sure your organization and board and senior management teams have come up with risk appetite statements in regards to how risk, how, how risk adverse are they to, let's say, having something or a system in the cloud? How risk adverse are they to having vendors uh, being able to access systems internally for support? Before a credit union brings in any of those platforms, you should know where your board and management team stands on if they'll support that level of risk or not. It's a huge benefit and it's something that our regulators are looking for. Uh, Paul alluded to this in his presentation as well. Security awareness programs and security training programs are a must to be incorporated into normal credit union operations. Uh, it's not even it's not good enough for us to have a single security training program once a year anymore. We do fish education, you know, fishing education uh, programs once a month now. Um, it is it has become so normalized for phishing attacks against the institution that it's critical we keep our staff's vigilance up um, because of that. So, Security awareness is a normal course of business now. Um, monitoring remote access channels and, and threat remediation in those channels. Paul mentioned the, the timely patching uh, of, of firewalls and remote access solutions. Uh, that is absolutely a commonality with our regulators here in the US. Um, and that sort of goes to the next point of patch and vulnerability management. It's, it's an oldie but a goodie, uh, so to speak, where um, it, it's not new, but there is a renewed focus on that. And the focus is ultimately on time to remediation, uh, meaning our regulators wanna see 
a much faster um, patch cycle for those systems, especially that are deemed critical uh, for the credit union. And they don't want to see, you know, weeks or months delay in patching those any longer. Um, server and workstation hardening standards based on industry supported uh, recommendations. Uh, it's interesting at Hudson Valley, we've had our own server and workstation hardening uh, procedures and policies for years. However, that's no longer considered to be uh, an acceptable option by our regulators. And they're now expecting um, our credit union staff and most credit unions to go and follow um, recognized standards by generally the, the federal and state governments in the US for security hardening. Um, another one that we've seen coming up and, and recently is uh, for those credit unions engaged in internal software development, uh, the governance and auditing of those platforms is um, majorly uh, important. And it's something that uh, our regulators are starting to see and, and focus on more and more often. So that's coming down the pipe and we're seeing that happen. Uh, and then lastly, I mentioned this before, but substantial proof of board and executive management involvement in information security governance. They, they're going to want uh, your, your minutes for those meetings. They wanna see what's discussed in those meetings and they wanna see the actionable items that are coming out uh, of those meetings as well. Next slide, please, Paul. So looking forward and go ahead to the next slide. Um, you know, sort of the, to recap the old way um, that of protecting your credit union, you know, if you had a firewall, an intrusion prevention and intrusion detection system, uh, antivirus software, you're limiting administrative permissions uh, on your desktops and, and your systems, and you're, you were rotating passwords, you know, you're kind of following the, the traditional standardized best practices, you know, life was pretty good. Um, you didn't worry too much. You felt you were pretty safe. Uh, and for those information security professionals out there, you, you had a better chance of, of sleeping through the night every night, not worrying about things. And go ahead, Paul, next slide. So, but the, the world has changed and the world has changed significantly, especially over the past 10 to 15 years. Um, you know, advanced persistent threats, APTs are the, are the new acronym and buzzwords of the day in information security. Uh, and generally these, these APTs are a, result, are a result from state sponsored offensive hacking operations. Uh, you see this coming out of uh, Asia, uh, former Soviet, you know, Soviet bloc, the Russia, um, there's, there's a significant amount of, of state sponsored activity uh, in these areas that we now have to defend against. Um, and, it's, and it's for any number of, of different reasons. Uh, it could be uh, for political reasons, it could be for espionage, it could be just for pure financial gain as we see sometimes uh, coming out of the North Korean area uh, and state. So there's, there's a significant amount of those types of operations going on. Uh, malware has gone from you know, what's malware uh, 15 years ago? It was that sort of annoying virus that your average antivirus program could clear off the platform, your systems to something that persists and is much more invasive. Uh, and then you had things like the rise of ransomware where it's not just about destroying systems or crippling systems, but now it's about money and extorting uh, money in the form of untraceable or or not overly traceable payment mechanisms like Bitcoin. Um, and then you also have new technologies that sort of played into this too. Public cloud computing is quickly becoming the norm, if not already essentially the norm in many technology sectors. Uh, bring your own device policies, complicated information security management significantly because now you're you're not in direct control of everything of, on that device, but only certain applications on it. Um, as cloud computing and outsourcing became more and more normalized, 
you know, we're now reliant on vendors for management of critical infrastructure where that may have been in house uh, formerly. Uh, social media use has skyrocketed in that amount of time. This has really, really played into the rise of phishing attacks and how effective they are. It is much, much easier to synthetically gather and form an identity of the target that you're, you're trying to, to get through a phishing attack using publicly available information on social media. It has really allowed um, phishing uh, what attacks to, to target and pinpoint uh, really the individuals they're going after, which in that's now become known as spear phishing uh, in, in the industry. And then lastly, um, you know, data encryption is, is, is the norm. It's no longer the exception. You know, I say, you know, why, why is this uh, a, a threat or a challenge uh, to credit unions? Well, in the past, if you had a firewall that was capable of inspecting encrypted traffic, HTTPS traffic, SSL traffic, it was fairly easy to know um, what was going on your network uh, through just installing uh, something called a man in the middle certificate and, and decrypting that traffic and understanding what was traversing through your firewalls. That's no longer really a, a, a process that is as easy to do. And with the rise of technologies like certificate pinning, um, it has become next to impossible to decrypt all of that traffic and understand what's going back and forth. So these bad actors um, have come, with, come away with it's much easier to now sneak things through encrypted channels in your firewalls and your, your perimeter defenses because they know you can't see all of that anymore because of the way SSL and encryption technologies have gone. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. So with that, we, we have to adapt a new mindset and this really echoes what Paul described in his, his um, uh, presentation as well. And I put sort of a, a funny um, picture image to the other side. It's been bounced around on different uh, uh, information security communities. And, and you know, it's, you have all of these defenses in depth, you have all of these tools, but that time that one user clicks on an email and they've just bypassed every single one of your defenses. Uh, and so it's no longer a question of if, it's a question of when. Uh, you will be breached something will get through and the question becomes, when does it happen and what do you do? Uh, secondly, users are your biggest threat. Um, it's, it's kind of sad to say, but the reality is, is that the most efficient way to get something through uh, your network defenses right now is to get something to a user and have them click on it, install it on their system, uh, run it in a web browser, uh, it, it's, it's the most effective way and it's really easy to send phishing emails. And even if only, you know, 5% of those are effective, it's more than enough uh, success for these types of criminals to keep going that route. Um, and so the question of, you know, the fact or the, the idea that you will eventually be infiltrated, infected, hacked, how are you going to respond? And stopping the attacks is still important, but the rapid detection and remediation is equally important in 2021. So containment and eradication of a threat will become normalized versus expecting to stop all threats at the virtual gates, that perimeter that's constructed by your firewalls, your intrusion prevention and detection systems and um, remote access gateways. Next slide, Paul. So how are we going to do that? Uh, what are the tools to, that, that us as information security practitioners and financial institutions are going to need to bring in and use to adapt to this changing environment? Uh, first is moving beyond traditional antivirus. Um, unfortunately, signature-based antivirus, uh, what I would call traditional antivirus is really almost ineffective uh, at this point at stopping advanced persistent threats and the new types of malwares that are coming out. Uh, the, the, the most 
significant change in antivirus software that we've seen and that we've adopted in the credit union here at Hudson Valley is moving towards behavioral based antivirus uh, tools that don't necessarily rely on those signatures, but rely on analyzing behavior of software on the system and being able to, with machine learning and technologies like that, detect behavior that is anomalous and stop it when, it, when it's seen. Uh, a good example of a solution that, that provides this today uh, are technologies from a company called CrowdStrike. They have a platform that does this uh, and it's quickly become recognized as an industry leader. Uh, deceptive technology and honeypots. This gets down to that idea that you are going to be infected or hacked or infiltrated. So how are you going to know when you are infiltrated? And deceptive technology and honeypots let you do that. They present targets for people that have gotten into your network that are very attractive for them to go and try and pivot to and, and investigate. And as soon as they do that, those activities trigger alarms in your network saying somebody's investigating something that no one would ever normally investigate. This is an issue. You need to go out and look at this. Um, those tools then have to be coupled with comprehensive SIM tools, security and event monitoring tools. And they need to be monitored 24 7, 365. Uh, you need a platform that is going to correlate and corroborate events so that when they do come in from all of these different tools that you're using, this can then look across these systems and see if patterns are emerging that don't fit the norm. And unfortunately, you need to be able to look at those patterns all times of day, every day of the year. And this is really where having security partners, vendor partners that can do that for you comes into play. Even as large as Hudson Valley Credit Union is, we don't have the staffing to do this 24-7, 365. We have vendor partners, security partners that do this for us because we need that visibility, but we can't staff fully enough to have a 24-7 operation in-house. Um, next generation firewalls and automated security analysis. This comes to um, the need for not just your traditional firewall rules, but firewalls that can adapt to application changes, as well as see what's going on in them, see what data is passing back and forth between them. And for example, when it sees an executable file or a script file being sent back and forth between one of your systems and an outside endpoint, it can go ahead, take that executable, run it in a virtual machine and decide, is this a threat or not? Um, it's, it's a really neat service and it's hugely impactful for protecting against new threats that you might not be aware of. Cloud access security brokers, CASBs for short, as the world goes to the public cloud, you need ways to detect and determine what activities are going on in your cloud environment. CASBs allow you to see that um, and understand what your users are doing and then also be proactive in stopping certain actions uh, from users that could present your organization or present risk to your organization. Data loss prevention tools. This isn't necessarily tool, uh, new, but it's important. Um, you want to prevent whether it's your member data or your organization's confidential and proprietary data from leaking outside your walls. Um, for a number of reasons. One, it could constitute a data breach, but also if certain information leaks outside of the organization that isn't even necessarily a breach, it could present information that allows bad actors to target your organization more effectively um, through phishing attacks, and that's equally as dangerous. Uh, Paul mentioned this as well, multi-factor authentication everywhere, whether that's to cloud service providers, the PCs internally on your network, MFA is really the norm now. Um, not having multi-factor authentication puts your organization at risk. And this is something that our regulators in the US have essentially mandated for most credit unions is that it's not good enough just for MFA on your internet banking platform. All of your staff have to have MFA processes to just to get into their PCs every day. 
um, doing threat hunts using that data that your security event management system logged. Um, you want to be able to not only just detect the, the patterns in real time, but on a periodic basis, have skilled professionals go back and look through that data as humans and see if they can come up with any patterns that the systems may have missed. Uh, again, we don't have the staffing to do this directly at the, at the US or, or in the Hudson Valley, um, but uh, it is something that we have a vendor partner that does for us and they have experts on staff that do it. Uh, and then we have monitoring those fourth party relationships. There are some really great tools to essentially monitor your vendors' vendors out there. Uh, one that we use here at Hudson Valley is called BitSight. It's fantastic. It gives us a lot of insight into the vendors and the vendors they use. And that's really important based on our regulatory requirements. And then lastly, um, federated single sign-on for credit union systems. The more you can um, consolidate your, your user access management and the role management for your credit union, the better chance you have and making sure people only have access to the systems they should have access to. And this can really come down to using systems like Okta or others that provide secure single sign-on and integrate into multiple different systems from let's say your Windows server, your Windows network Active Directory platform. So uh, with that, uh, that's uh, I believe the end of my presentation and I'll turn it back over. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. I really appreciate the effort that both you and Paul put into your presentations. It, uh, it, it really can, it can seem overwhelming, I think this topic and you really broke it down very well, both from the small and large credit union perspective. We do have a number of questions, so I want to get right to those. And it looks like a number of people are very uh, interested in asking about the cloud and how much infrastructure should be on the cloud. We'll start with Chris. He asks, um, well, Chris and Brian, two different questions, but one asks, is it advisable to put core banking on the cloud? And then another is, how much of your infrastructure at your credit unions has actually been moved over to the cloud? Do you want to start that one, Jonathan? I'll come in afterwards. Sure. So uh, I'll go ahead and take a crack at those two questions. So um, from our perspective, from our information security standpoint and our risk appetite, as we've uh, created in the organization, we would not be comfortable putting our uh, core banking platform in what I would call the public cloud, like Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure or something like that. However, uh, that being said, many core banking providers now offer their own private cloud solutions uh, for the, their core banking platforms. And that is something that we're, we're actively interested in. Uh, it's an environment that we know and we can trust, and it's specifically built for our core banking platform. Um, and so we are interested in looking at potentially moving to that in, down the road. Today, we're still in-house um, and mostly because of the flexibility we want on our platform, not because we have a necessarily a concern with moving to the vendor's private cloud. So I would say it really depends on the cloud environment. I wouldn't go to public cloud yet necessarily on core but I might go to a vendor's private cloud. And I, I think that could be very worthwhile from a cost standpoint. Um, secondly, you know, in terms of how much infrastructure uh, do we have in the cloud today? Uh, I would say that Hudson Valley has been very conservative in moving to the cloud in a cloud environment. Uh, we still maintain our own data center infrastructure, both a primary and secondary data center. Um, that being said, we are moving more and more to the cloud, especially as our vendors move to the cloud environment. So we have a significant number of, uh, of vendors that have already done that. I would say that um, in terms of our own just purely internal infrastructure, we've just started moving to the cloud environment and we've, we've looked at and really settled on uh, the Microsoft Azure environment for our needs. Uh, and we're starting to look at moving some of our larger 
uh, data warehousing and business analytics workloads to that, that environment, as well as some of our remote access gateways. Uh, Paul, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, yeah. So uh, it's similar position, actually, Jonathan. If I look around credit unions in the UK, there are some, some leaders in this space who've already gone fully into public cloud and are doing that with their core systems. But it tends to be the exception. And most credit unions, I think, uh, including my own, uh, would look at public cloud as an opportunity, but also a threat. I mean, the problem with public cloud is if you look at the configuration requirements uh, for the shared security model, for instance, in Amazon, and it's similar in Azure, um, you've got to be pretty competent at configuring all that stuff because it's your responsibility to get it right. And that's actually quite a significant technical challenge, even with public cloud. Um, so I think the challenge with cloud, I agree with you. You know, that's definitely the direction of travel for the industry. Um, we're looking at it as further as well. Um, but for us, the challenge is having the skill to be able to manage and secure it properly. And I think I would say that if you don't have that skill, it's a dangerous place to go. You know, if you use public cloud, you've got to be ready to do your part of securing it. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. Uh, Nabeen has a question, a uh, very technical question. How often should a credit union perform an IS audit or a BAPT test? Is it mandatory and what are the benefits from this? So I'll, I'll just speak generally uh, on IT audits and, and specifically um, because I think it will change a lot of this is mandated by your regulators, whoever's, whoever's governing the credit union. And then a lot of it is also going to be managed, governed by your risk appetite and, and how often you wanna do this and the resources you have available. Um, so from, from our personal perspective at Hudson Valley, we, we do a number of things on a very regular basis. So we do a quarterly uh, external vulnerability scan uh, of all of our systems. We do monthly internal vulnerability scans of all of our systems. We do annual, what I would call um, very more significant penetration tests into our network from the outside, where we actually have you know, sort of red team information security professionals trying to get in. Um, and then we also do a independent audit of all of our internal systems once a year, uh, in addition to our federal and state regulators. So, we have a very um, prescribed approach, I would say here uh, at Hudson Valley. And then the other piece of this, and I mentioned this in, in part of my presentation and Paul mentioned as well, uh, the, the security awareness training. We do security awareness training monthly with all of our users um, because that is our biggest threat. And then we also have a yearly module, uh, learning module that all of our users go through as a refresher as well. So. We, we try and take a very methodical approach to that. Um, our, I would say our approach is probably beyond what our regulators you know, uh, mandate specifically, but we think it's the right approach for our credit union where it, it matches the resources we have available to do these as well as the threats that we feel are most significant in, in the outside world. Yeah, I mean, I think what you've just described, Jonathan, is, is probably uh, world-class best practice. Um, if I look at the IT world, I know in the UK, both in and outside credit unions, uh, I think probably vulnerability scanning, I would have said is generally something organizations that do that at all, probably do it monthly, mostly. It's the challenge with the vulnerability scan is you can pick up a whole load of vulnerabilities, but if you do it again, they'll, unless you fix them, they'll, they'll still be there and they're usually graded, you know, seriousness, maybe one to five. Um, you're not going to be able to close all of those immediately and some of them you'll never close. So if you're going to do vulnerability scanning, you've got to have the system to manage what you do with that answer and the time and the resource to actually apply it. But I, I think what you said was great practice. And, and I, you know, just to follow on to that, Paul, I think you make a great point about the vulnerability scanning and managing the output from that process. Um, you know, whether you have five people looking at this or 105 people looking at this, you're still going to have to prioritize what you tackle first, second, third, and fourth. And so you need in your security policies to have that very clearly defined that with it for critical prior, you know, vulnerabilities, we're going to get them to them within this amount of time for medium, this amount of time, your regulators 
and our regulators certainly look for that. It's not just that we're scanning for them, but we're also following our own remediation guidelines. Yeah, and there are some that you, you just won't get to. It depends what they are. And the scanners, the scanners pick out all kinds of different things. Depending on the system, some of them may not be a risk to you. So there's, a, there's judgment required as well. All right, let's go to a question from Ernest. He says, you mentioned data loss prevention, but did not talk about data recovery, which I feel is equally important and should be integrated. So I, I, I guess um, for, for, for me, um, data recovery is absolutely as important. And so data recovery, uh, I see is a, is a little different. Um, and I do think it's, it's changed. Uh, to a degree in regards to the environment that we're in now, especially with the cloud. Um, what's been interesting from my standpoint is we've seen um, a lot of organizations move away from what I would call air-gapped data recovery options where you have physical media or some type of media that is not online, not connected to the internet, but available should you need it. And so Hudson Valley has taken, again, I think a, a very conservative approach, but one that meets the threat, especially with ransomware as prevalent as it is now. So we do a couple of things. We, we have uh, online backups to network attached storage devices. We then have locally stored um, media backups in the form of tape. We still use tape. And then we still also archive long-term recovery tape to uh, an organization outside the institution with secure, rec with secure facilities so that should all of our systems become compromised and even our online backups become compromised, we can take those physical media recovery options that have been air-gapped that aren't online and restore our systems from those. So I do think having a, a multi-tiered recovery process in terms of your data and how it's stored is absolutely critical, especially with ransomware being as prevalent as it is, because you don't want to be one of those organizations that's unfortunately forced to pay the ransom because ultimately that serves to encourage the behavior further and that hurts the entire industry. Yeah, I'd support that. I mean, I did make the point that, that you need a way of backing up. And I agree with Jonathan, multi-tier is the right way to go on this. So for my own credit union, as a smaller credit union, we, we run backups routinely on network for our different servers. We've got a couple of small branches and we use one as a business continuity site for the other and copy our data overnight between the two for our file data. Um, that happens automatically and we manage our transaction data hourly between the two so that we've got our transactions in both places. That's our first level, if you like. And then behind that, as well as some stuff we do off site, um, we do a cloud backup um, to a provider who provides multiple generations of cloud backup. It's all fully encrypted. Um, so that provides us with another way of getting our data back should we need to. And I guess the replication protects us against you know, something going wrong technically as well. You know, we're also worried about business continuity. You know, we, we're a small organization. If we lose, lose a key server, that, that's a big issue for us. Um, so we need a way of recovery from ourselves and from technical problems as well as from other incidents. But recovery is, is really, really critical. So yeah, it's a great place to go. I, I, I can recall a, an instant in the UK as well where one of the credit unions shared a story where they were doing all that and they were doing backup, but they'd overflowed their limit on their online backup. And so actually the backups were corrupt and not usable and they, they noticed and then they start it up again, but you need to keep an eye on those sorts of issues as well. So test your backups or check it's still working. All right. Uh, we do have a, a number of more questions in the queue. Unfortunately, we're coming up on the top of the hour here and we, we've got to make sure that we get people off to where they need to be for their work days here. Um, I do want to mention though, that if, we, if you have questions in the queue, we'll try to get those emailed to Jonathan and Paul and get those answered for you. Um, and we also want to let you know, if you want to recommend this webinar to anyone, um, it was recorded. It'll be available later today on the World Council YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash woku, youtube.com slash w-o-c-c-u. Um, and again, I want to thank you both, Paul and Jonathan. You guys uh, both uh, really, really broke this subject down well. And, and sharing this insight and time, I think, is really valuable for a lot of the people who are on uh, this panel today and, and participating in this event. 
And I want to mention too, if you're looking to continue learning about cybersecurity in credit unions, be sure to register for the World Credit Union Conference. The World Credit Union Conference is going to take place virtually this year from July 14th to the 21st. We'll be discussing the topic of cybersecurity with such experts as Ashley Dubel, Chief Information Security Officer at Heritage Bank in Australia, and also Ger Ger excuse me, Gerard Joyce, co-founder at CalQ Risk in Ireland and chairman of the Irish Risk Management Standards Committee. And you can register for the World Credit Union Conference at wcuc.org, wcuc.org, and we hope to see you there. Again, thank you for joining this webinar and have a great day.